at the last arena if you were there. So enabling governance arrangements are a combination of actor constellations and institutional settings that have proven a potential to support urban governance towards just and sustainable cities. So it's basically about two things. On the one hand, it's about direct actions. So how do actors interact with each other? And by that, we mean all actors inside of a city. So we mean businesses, we mean local government, community groups, or marginalized groups. So it's about these actors and their actions, but also about the framework for this interaction. And that is, that is what is meant by institutional settings. So it's kind of about the question how policies, laws, finances, or something like a local political culture set the stage for this interaction. And we're also saying that these EGAS have proven potential to support urban governance towards just and sustainable cities. So we're not saying that they all necessarily lead to more sustainable and just cities. Um, but that these principles have shown potential in helping interventions that combine sustainability and justice in their efforts in the past. And I think this gets clearer once I explained our methodology behind them. So our empirical basis for, for these enabling governance arrangements are called governance interventions. And these are all real world examples of urban projects, which can be municipality led, um, community led, or something in between that try to make cities a little more sustainable and just. And all of these governance interventions come from a list of 112 previously studied interventions in Urbana. And we selected exactly those because they provided the most detail on governance processes, on actor constellations, and so on. So once we had done our research, we documented all of this information on actor constellations, on institutional frameworks, and I think maybe the most important thing that kind of passively came to light were pieces of information of why these interventions were successful. And what we then did as a next step was that we actively started searching for these pieces of information or enabling factors. And we looked for anything that seemed important. And we found stuff related to internal project management, but also to all kinds of external interactions between the project, other actors in the cities, or very important framework conditions. And once we had all of these factors, we, we started looking for similarities between them and we started to combine them. And the result of, of this process um, are basically our enabling governance arrangements. So they combine multiple examples from these different interventions. So to break it all down, they essentially are patterns that were identified as enabling positive change in multiple governance interventions. So that's why I was mentioning earlier that they have shown potential to support urban governance towards sustainable and just cities, as they did so in these interventions. So out of the 11 cases, we extracted six enabling governance arrangements for now, but for sure there are several more that, that could be identified. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take you through each one of these enabling governance arrangements for around two minutes each. and. As already mentioned, you can indicate by changing your name about which one of those you would like to talk in the beginning of the next record rooms. So I would suggest um, we're going to start looking at them right now, and we will also link them to the drivers of injustice, as mentioned, which were previously discussed in the last arena. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Sophie for the first enabling governance arrangement. Thanks, Jacob, for that introduction. So I will kick things off by talking about our first enabling governance arrangement we found, which was to create a comprehensive vision of change. And you can see this illustrated in the vignette on, on the slide here. We found that developing a comprehensive vision of change, whether it's for an entire city or for a smaller community project is a really important first step in creating sustainable and just cities. And so, at this point, let's ask, what does comprehensive mean? And it can mean a few things, but from a municipality perspective, uh, a comprehensive vision of change is one that connects different scales and sectors. So it integrates sustainability and justice concerns really across the board um, and connects them to pre-existing city policies as well. 
And a great example of this is the traffic calming superblocks concept in Barcelona, which was actually embedded in multiple municipal policies. So ranging from mobility policies to climate change policies to uh, green infrastructure policies, for example. And what this did is it formed a very comprehensive vision of how superblocks could help make Barcelona more sustainable and just. But of course, this can also be done from a smaller scale. Uh, and when you think about community projects, often what they can do is empower a diverse group of people to get together and to ask these big uh, and fundamental questions about how they imagine the future of their area to be, as well as more practical questions of how to get there. And so we can also link this enabling governance arrangement back to a driver of injustice that was discussed at our last arena. And some of you might recall one called uneven and exclusionary urban intensification and regeneration, which you can also see on the right hand side of the slide. And so what does this mean really? So just for example, picture a sustainability project such as an eco district and think about the potential negative impacts that this could have on long term residents through forces like gentrification. And so we think that developing a comprehensive vision of change in an inclusive manner may help avoid unjust urbanization by intentionally finding a balance between social um, and ecological goals as well as economic goals for an area. But of course, developing a comprehensive vision is, is not an easy process. There's going to be conflicts, there's different priorities that people will have, and it requires follow up with action. But overall, we found that there's a lot of potential here for this to enable governance of sustainable and just cities. So in a nutshell, that's the first enabling governance arrangement. I will hand it back over to Jakob to describe the second one. Thank you, Sophie. So our second enabling governance arrangement is called Making Space for Adaptation and Experimentation. And this really refers to a type of project management that allows for detours and modifications on the way to the overarching goal or vision of the project or the comprehensive vision of change. And what this means is that we believe that initiatives can really profit from rethinking and reevaluating to adapt their plans and to choose new paths if new information comes to light. And I mean, it's obvious that projects in general, not even just related to sustainable and just cities, have to be somewhat flexible in their management, especially if it's clear that the, may, the way the, the project is managed right now will not lead to, to a certain goal. But this enabling governance arrangement goes one step further. It's not just about this reactive type of adapting, but also about proactively adopting an experimental way of managing the project, which can mean giving way to, to a probe and learn approach or to, to really allow for mistakes. And one example from our work where allowing for uh, adopting an experimental approach really fueled the project was the case of Augustenborg. And this is a holistic neighborhood development program in Malmö. And especially the, the positive culture of allowing for mistakes, which, which stemmed from this experimental approach, led to a lot of creativity in the project. And this really became obvious after this world culture got lost as, as people changed and new people in the same positions were, were more afraid to make mistakes, which then led to the project getting stuck and stuck more, more regularly. So in this great case, really the, the critical mass of people with an experimental mindset who, who are not afraid to make mistakes really enabled that project. And we believe that this experimental approach addresses the driver of injustice referring to unfit institutional structures. Because adapting and experimenting builds on working together outside of, of sectoral silos, which are really at the basis of this, this driver of injustice. And to some degree, experimenting also stands opposite to this organizational rigidity. So with, with um, this experimental approach, we believe to some degree that um, these unfit institutional structures can be overcome. And also, as well as with comprehensive vision of change, not everything is, is sunshine when you're flexible, because we're not saying that being more flexible is always better as it's very crucial to, to not lose focus on the ultimate goal of, of a project and experiment for the sake of it. And with these words of caution, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Cassia. 
Hi, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the enabling governance arrangement, build bridges between separate stakeholder groups. And this governance arrangement is all about information sharing because in a city, when you have a variety of stakeholders working towards a common goal via different pathways, they may encounter difficulties sharing knowledge and resources amongst themselves. And a solution that we came up to with this was that of intermediaries or rather that we identified was using intermediaries. And those can be individuals, they can be organizations. Cities are also able to act as intermediaries and these intermediaries create spaces or pathways via which this information can be shared between stakeholder groups. And when it's needed, also translated into a vocabulary that is relevant for the stakeholder group. Not just to prevent the information siloing that Jakob just discussed, but also to really make sure that everybody feels heard and to really intentionally center marginalized voices. And an example of this that we found in our research is here in Freiburg, the Vaubant neighborhood. And that is a neighborhood that was designed to be really socially and ecologically just. And it was developed in conjunction with the city planning council. And that council had representatives from different municipal actors and also city inhabitants. And in this example, it's actually the council that acted as an intermediary because it was a place where these different stakeholders were able to come together to discuss their priorities and their projects, share knowledge, and also really mediate conflict in the instance that it arose. And the driver of injustice that is relevant here is the lack of effective knowledge brokerage and stewardship opportunities. And this um, driver of injustice really just underscores how injustice is furthered when information is not shared, when it isn't shared effectively or equally among different actor groups. And so before I hand this off to Nadia, I just want to underscore how important intermediaries can be in intentionally and effectively sharing information so that all of the stakeholders involved in a project or goal not only have the vocabulary that they need to create change, but also the systems knowledge that they need in order to participate truly fully. So thank you. Thank you very much, Cassia, and hello, everyone. Committing to a meaningful participation process certainly is one of the highly debated topics in urban governance. It also came up frequently in our discussions so far in this event for our project committing to a meaningful participation process, both in municipality-led and community-led urban initiatives entail serious consideration of citizens' inputs in its design and governance. A meaningful participation may mean different for different topics, for technical topics, for example, the goal of meaningful participation process could be to open up a dialogue forum for residents for expressing their doubts and concerns. This might then offer the opportunity and resources for residents to take the responsibility for some aspects of the project. Furthermore, the participation process have to be aware that engagement might decline over time if no physical outcomes of participation can be seen in the area. Institutions should have a long-term commitment to the process in order to build trust and assure res residents that their time and energy investment is not wasted. An example of the meaningful participation process can be taken from the Carnese neighborhood project in Rotterdam. Rotterdam. The project proponents approached participation in two ways. First, residents were engaged in a deliberative process envisioning the district. Second, residents practically contributed by engaging in a community center and a community garden. Committing to a meaningful participation process helps overcome a driver of injustice explored previously by Urbana, which has limited citizens' participation in urban planning. The driver of injustice refers to limit, limited involvement and engagement of citizens and their initiatives and decision-making around planning, designing, implementation, and evaluation of urban sustainability oriented interventions. Thank you, everyone. I will pass it on to Sophia. Thanks so much, Nadia. Uh, I will be presenting our enabling governance arrangement number five, which is tapping into tap into existing community networks. Uh, the general ambition behind this enabling governance arrangement is to strengthen relationships between stakeholders who are working on similar or contemporary issues. As you can see uh, in this vignette, the uh, learning from others' experiences can avoid recreating the wheel. 
So new initiatives can connect to community networks in many ways. For example, in the sharing of resources, uh, including human resources and electronic tools, knowledge exchange about organizational structure or support in problem solving and learning from similar initiatives that are taking place elsewhere. Learning from other communities can support uh, an emerging initiatives with the resources and expertise to more efficiently achieve their objectives, as well as to gain political and public support. There are also many benefits for organizations to teach others. So sharing knowledge with newer projects can strengthen networks between and uh, within communities, and it can bolster an organization's reputation and legitimacy. It also uh, offers opportunities for additional organizational support. Food sharing is a really good example of this enabling governance arrangement. F local food sharing groups tapped into the resources of their national network to develop, for example, by using their online platform, but they also built relationships with local institutions, for example, with community centers who would host their public fridges uh, or with food retailers to provide the food. Lastly, food sharing has been able to extend beyond its organizational network to support initiatives that are starting up elsewhere. So the group Why Unity originates from food sharing and it develops online platforms and tools that enables others to start their own food sharing network. Uh, tapping into community networks can counter injustices that are caused by a weakening, uh, a weakened civil society. Building relationships between community organizations, government actors and local businesses can allow for greater impact of and access to the benefits of sustainability and justice efforts and generally would strengthen the fabric of society within and between cities. Mutual support and knowledge exchange between movements can also increase legitimacy and help to overcome regulatory or political barriers. Uh, and with that, I will pass it on to Roman for our final enabling governance arrangement. Thank you, Sokia. So our last um, enabling governance arrangement is tap, uh, develop resistant and self-sufficient uh, financing arrangement. So uh, we found that sector funding are crucial for a community initiative to develop and sustain over time. And this is especially true for grassroots organizations working, for example, in the social sector that often highly rely on public grants and subsidies. However, in a context of political and social turbulences, such as now the COVID-19 pandemic, a financial crisis or growing austerity, public funding can dry up quickly and let an organization resources to keep operating. Um, in this case, we recognize how important it is a, for project proponents to foresee financial challenges and diversify the head uh, they funding resources to make sure that the project uh, can sustain despite budget cuts and crisis. And we found a fruitful example of resilient financial arrangement in the community land trust project in Brussels, which is a social real estate developer that builds affordable housing on collectively owned land for people with limited means. So what they did is that in addition to public subsidies, the organization opened up for private actors of the social economy sectors, as well as to citizens to co-finance land purchase and management under the community land trust model. However, the, the main challenge uh, appearing when organizations diversify their funding resources and to some extent deem themselves free from public funding is to downplay responsibility of government for collective welfare. This is what the, um, the driver of injustice and question neoliberal growth and austerity urbanism is about. That is a process of privatization, budget cuts, and states which grow from various sectors. Um, in that case, the success of organization, let's say, making it on their own, may foster state withdrawal and limit public funding in the future. So as a result, organizations find themselves into this tension between on the one hand, consolidating their financial situation, and on the other hand, advocating for continued public funding. So thank you, and I pass it on now to Jakob. Back. So thanks to Roman and to everyone. Um, and now that you have heard about all of our enabling governance arrangements, and also you saw all of our beautiful vignettes, um, you still have around five or 10 more minutes to change your name to indicate about which one of them you would like to talk about. 
And if you don't indicate it all, you will be fine as well, and you will be just uh, assorted randomly. And I see that um, there are some preferences for some of our breakout rooms, um, which I saw that Tom posted earlier. So it might be possible that you're not going to be able to be assigned to, to your favorite enabling governance arrangement, and I'm sure you understand. Um, yeah. So the aim of, of these breakout rooms really is, is to make the best of, of your very diverse breakout, uh, backgrounds and experiences from the different cities that you come from across Europe, and also to gather your feedback on these enabling governance arrangements. So as mentioned, the first part will be about one specific, the first part of the breakout room will be about one specific enabling governance arrangements. And it will be about examples that you know that support this governance arrangement and what you think is the most crucial or the most important takeaway from it for um, urban governance towards sustainable and just cities. But you're also obviously invited to share thoughts on, on downsides, on limits of this um, governance arrangements or any words of any notes of caution that you have. And then the second part of the next breakout um, room will be about opening up the discussion um, beyond these six enabling governance arrangements. And you're invited to more generally talk about what you think is needed to support urban governance for sustainable and just cities. And a big goal of this session is to give you as much time as possible for, for the discussions in the breakout rooms. So there will be no reporting back afterwards in plenary. But, and that's a big but, the discussions here will, will not come to nothing as they will be the starting point for our agenda setting in session seven tomorrow. And we're going to try to keep the breakout rooms between this session that's going to come now, between the breakout rooms in the session that um, are going to come now, and session seven somewhat similar. So you might continue to dis yeah, might continue your discussions right now tomorrow with with similar people and to kind of lead into an agenda in the end. Are there any questions right now? Philip, I see you unmuted yourself. <laughs> I can't actually hear you. I'm not sure if it's my. No, I cannot hear, Philip. Okay. Uh, okay. So the questions have been, the keywords have been uh, listed in the chat again. So if you want to express your preference, um, have a look at the chat and use Bridges Participation Finance. No, that those are pretty full. But um, vision, adaptation, bridges, participation, networking or finances, these are the overall options. So the breakout room will again start in five minutes. Um, that gives you a break and um, gives some time for the formation of the breakout rooms. And then we'll have actually um, 70 minutes, so plenty of time, including a break. There will be again facilitators and note takers to support you and uh, to take you through this, um, through the guiding questions that Jakob has mentioned. And um, as I've said, there's, there's plenty of time. Uh, and we are looking forward to learning from your 